Hello world, welcome to The Unpavement. I'm your host, Jeremy McGee. If you're new to the channel, I'm in a wheelchair. I've got a cool mountain bike, but I've gotten into trouble out there on the trail. So I'm on a mission to document trails for adaptive riders. This channel is a lot more than that though. It's turned into something a lot bigger, a lot more fun. Make sure you check out my videos and subscribe and come along on my adventures with me. This video is a little different. Well, a lot different than anything I've done before. This is a video of a podcast with Bobby Ricard of Natural State Bikes. Now, this is his podcast that I am reposting. So if you wanna go check out his stuff directly, there's a link in the caption to him. He's a really cool guy. He's doing good stuff and providing great value, so make sure you check him out. In the meantime, grab a beverage of your choice, whether it's caffeinated, an adult beverage, or something actually hydrating. Sit back, enjoy, have a good time, and hopefully you get inspired. Talking with Jeremy McGee. Jeremy, how are you? I'm good, Bobby. Thanks for having me, brother. Hey, yeah, man. I am inspired by your story. I've been able to go through your content. Uh, it's been great. We were visiting a little bit before we just started recording this. And um, for our listeners, presently, I guess, if you looked at the top of your list of experiences on your LinkedIn account. It says you're an adaptive trail consultant, but yeah. you've got such a great story. And as you shared again in LinkedIn, it's really your life's divided into really two chapters. The first chapter you were out, you know, blazing the trails for yourself. And the second chapter you're pioneering and blazing trails. So others can get out and experience nature and that was all Absolutely. kind of triggered triggered by an, uh, an accident in 2001 when you were struck by a vehicle riding your motorcycle right so kind of Correct. walk us through that uh, those chapters of your life oh man let's bust out the whiskey let's let's yeah. go deep <laughs> um well i mean yeah it's it's chapters and there's many more than two um but yeah, I just kind of see it as just a, it's been a process, you know? Um, well, one, I, I didn't really have parents. I, I didn't really grow up with any parenting. I didn't really have um, anyone that kind of helped me understand, you know, who I am, what I'm good at, you know, encouraged me. I just kind of went from, the, with the flow bounced around like a pinball with you know without direction pretty much my entire life to be honest with you I kind of figured things out later in life um, because of you know not having that parental direction that helped me figure out that earlier so right now I'm kind of making up for lost time but um yeah I ended up I was uh working towards uh being a career lifeguard. Um, I was waiting tables at a restaurant, which was the most fun job I've ever had. If you've ever worked in a restaurant, I was having a blast um, partying, girls, surfing, snowboarding, um, working out like crazy. Um, you know, the kind of stuff you do in your 20s, you know? <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Living the yeah. life. Yeah. Living the life. Um, and I was even starting to make a little bit of like photo incentive money from, uh, from snowboarding and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, one day, you know, running errands with my buddy who was also on a motorcycle. I, I was six blocks from my apartment. I fall right into that statistic and, um, ladies made a quick left turn in front of me into a 7-Eleven parking lot. And next thing I know, well, the vision that I have of that moment that I still see so clearly today when I close my eyes is 
my face smashed up against her side mirror, like her side mirror in my face. That's what I see. Uh, kind of crazy. And then it's funny. It's well, not funny, but interesting. Everything went dark after that. Um, and I was laying in the street, unable to get up. And everything was dark. I couldn't see. Uh, and, um, you know, I was a lifeguard at the time, at the time, and I was uh, very familiar with assessing injuries in a uh, emergency situation. So that's what I did. I applied my knowledge to myself and I started assessing my injuries. So first thing, I couldn't get up. I couldn't feel my legs. Um, I knew I had a spinal injury immediately. And I was like, okay, I can't move. Second, um, and very powerfully hit me every breath was very, very painful. Uh, just to breathe hurts so bad, just searing pain. I'm like, okay, I've got broken ribs. Turned out I broke almost all of them. Um, which if you've ever had a broken rib or even a separated rib, you know that breathing, sneezing, coughing, burping, is so, so terrible, um, so painful. Okay, so that was injury number two, broken ribs. Um, number three, I tasted blood in my mouth. I'm like, okay, I probably got punctured lungs from those broken ribs. Um, and then four was the serious one, which is kind of crazy, thinking that number four was the serious one, given the first three injuries. Um, but I could feel my hands and my face getting cold really fast really fast. Um, I was like, oh crap, I am bleeding um, either internally or somewhere where I can't feel because um, I, I don't I can't feel where. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure I'm losing blood because I'm getting really cold really fast. And I was laying there on the pavement. It was a warm Sunday late afternoon in the summer. And the pavement was really warm and I just, it felt so inviting, Bobby. I just wanted to, uh, I was starting to feel really tired and it just felt really inviting to just fall asleep right there. And I started to let myself drift off. Um, and I, my one thought was like, oh, I just, I'm okay. I just want my mom and my friends to know that I'm okay right now. I've lived a full life already as a 25 year old at that time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm okay with this and I'm at peace. Um, this very, very interesting moment just so happens that there were paramedics across the street at a taco shop. How long does it take you to like drop your taco and run across the street? Yeah. Seconds. My little moment in the street there, although it seemed like a long time um, was only a few seconds and uh, they were on me. Um, and it was business time. It was like, okay, they kind of shook me out of um, my state. And uh, I mean, not literally, they can't shake someone with a spinal cord injury, <laughs> uh, but they were on me um, and they, you know, they, they pulled the ambulance around and these were full, full blown paramedics, not just uh, EMT. So I got the real deal. And um, they took my helmet off and then I could see, turns out that's why everything was dark is when I hit my helmet got shifted sideways. Oh, wow. And I okay. could, that's why I was blind and couldn't see and I didn't realize it. Um, so they took my helmet off and all of a sudden I could see and I was like, okay, it's business time. Let's survive. You know, they backboarded me, um, got me in the ambulance and then, um, the, the paramedic in the back was like, okay, they're ready for you at the hospital. You're going right into surgery. Um, all I need you to do is sign this form. And my hand was, was strapped down he put a pen in my hand and put this, uh, um, clipboard of the paper in front of me. And I just went, I was like, that's not really my signature. Does it matter? And he's like, nope, doesn't matter. And he had a syringe. He kind of shot it in the air a little bit. And boom, I was out. <laughs> wow. There. He put me out. And um, next thing I know, I, I woke up in the MRI tube. 
No kidding. Yeah, they saved my life, man. Yeah, I mean, talk about right place, right time for those guys. Be a totally different story. Yeah, and then yeah, it turns out I had uh, I was bleeding externally. Um, you know, on a motorcycle, the gas tank sits right in front of you. You know, so on impact, my wow. perennial perennial area, you know, my chode just <laughs> split open on impact, and that's where. Um, that's where I was bleeding from and I, where I couldn't feel. Wow. So how, what was, what was the hospital stay and the recovery? You know, what kind of time frames are we talking about there? I was only in the hospital for six weeks, man, before I was out. The, they do a really good job at, um, you know, this is in 2001. Things are different now. Um, and it also depends what hospital you're in. If they, they specialize in, you know, spinal cord injury rehab and stuff like that or not but anyways it was this was a long time ago now and um they did a really good job of saving me but just kind of scuttled me out the door to figure out my new life with a 75 pound hospital wheelchair and wow um just um kind of a a trash bag of a small trash bag of catheters to figure that out on my own and uh <laughs> wow. that's a whole other deal yeah, yeah. just trying to get approval through insurance for just a pee you know <laughs> yeah and uh having to figure all that out and it so was kind of gnarly but so they just kind of put you out and would you if i read correctly do you end up going back to your mom's to kind of rehab and get things sorted out is that how that yeah. worked out? Well, you know, in the hospital, it was kind of a, you know, get, uh, get like, like back to a state of survive, being able to survive, you know? So, you know, once I had like back surgery and surgeries for the other stuff, and I was in this like turtle shell brace, um, then I was like, you know, I kind of proved really fast that, you know, I could get around on my own and everything. So then I was out the door. So yeah, six weeks later, after that crazy day, I am back in my apartment with my roommate. Okay. Um, and that was tough because, you know, I was a waiter and a lifeguard and all of a sudden I'm not making any money. I'm not working, just trying to figure out I had to go to the bathroom, you know, <laughs> that kind of took precedent. Um, so he was like buying groceries and spotting me for rent, working overtime. Like he's just one of my best friends. He's, he's amazing. Um, and that was not a sustainable situation, you know? So I, a after guy, I think maybe it was like six months or so I ended up, uh, back at mom's house okay yeah for a yeah. little while yeah to figure that out uh, but then i got a little bit of a settlement not much at all um but enough to um you know get get an apartment on my own and uh give me a little time to to figure my life out um after being at mom's house for a year or so and that's that's what led you down to this path of uh being an adaptive trail consultant and and so you started out from there um you, yeah i wouldn't i guess to back up a little bit just to be thankful that you were in the best shape or in really great shape working out yeah, man. surfing doing all that 25 that, years old 25 year old you know semi-pro athlete I, yeah uh, yeah I, yeah that, luckily, that helped that helped tons in your recovery Fit definitely some, helped some oh, my, oh my god there's almost 20 years in between there by the way from from that time to becoming an adaptive trail consultant yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, there's a, a lot of time in there there's a huge Definitely. history in there um and that's what i got really uh, deep into when i was going through all your content um you know you mentioned you know you semi-pro but then as a result of the accident you're, you're a professional paraplegic athlete right 
Yeah, for a time I was uh, not, and I'm not on payroll with anybody anymore. Um, but yeah, I've I've been on actual payroll receiving checks from companies as uh, an adaptive adventure athlete, which has yeah. been amazing, very amazing. So yeah, officially professional. Um, that's that's been a really cool chapter of my life. Um, and, and mixed mixed in with with. Uh uh biking where you kind of at least where i think you find yourself right now you know with adaptive trail design and and and, and biking you were uh, were or do still surf and ski right yep yep surfing is my my main sport um born and raised san diego grew up caught my first wave when i was 12 years old and uh you know went to a college um, here in San Diego, that was right on the water and just have surfed my ass off. Yeah. Uh, that's my number one. I'm a waterman. I love being in the ocean. I love paddling, getting close to whales. Um, that's my number one. Um, but yeah, I've kind of found myself riding the crest of this other really huge wave right now. And that is, you know, land management um really wanting to make trail some of their trails adaptive friendly and i just happen to be right there right now um but what's interesting about that is i'm not a mountain biker i don't consider myself a mountain biker um i'm a runner um you know like i was telling you i didn't have a the parents to really you know help me with you know realizing what i'm good at in life um, and when you don't have that, you know, as a teenager, you kind of just uh, follow the flow, do what's cool. So I played football in high school and, grow and growing up. Um, and uh, I was good at it, but I wasn't great. I wasn't going to go anywhere with it. I mean, I'm not a built for that sort of thing, you know. Um, but yeah, I applied myself. I worked hard, so I did good. Um, but uh, if I would have had the parents to um, help realize, you know, what I'm actually good at, what I could take somewhere, uh, I would have ran cross country and been in the drama club. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I would have done that instead. Um, so, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a runner at heart. Um, and I always say, if I wasn't in a wheelchair, I'd be running through the jungle. I'd be one of those weird, like ultra trail runners, I think. Yeah. And, yeah. um, trail running with just, you know, in a pair of trunks barefoot with a, with a buck knife on my hip, right. <laughs> you know, diving through, uh, rivers, scaling cliffs, you know, I, that's probably what I'd be doing. Yeah, um, I like that the way you kind of describe that. And I was good as I mentioned going through your content. I think at some point, maybe back in, in one of the pieces I read, maybe from Bicycling Magazine, you're you're you've got a no holds barred approach to life. I mean, so we're out there, you're out there doing all this adventure stuff, you know, triathlons, running, surfing, skiing, biking. Uh and, you know, I want to talk a little bit about your skiing background. I've, I picked up and read about uh, drop in and your uh, adventure skiing uh, uh, background and, and I watched the video. So can I, for our listeners, kind of share about, about that aspect as well? Um, yeah, I can totally do that. Um um well just to finish my previous thought uh real quick um i don't want to leave that incomplete um you know so yeah so i'm a trail runner but yeah I've, this bike is how i trail run gotcha and so yeah. i've decided to fully embrace that go on my trail adventures but also throw on the full face and the gear and ride the bike park yeah and here and and here we are <laughs> now uh you know, riding everywhere and adaptive trail consulting, which has been amazing. And skiing all happened, you know, I, I was snowboarding, you know, before my accident and um, 
after, you know, I, I decided that I was going to, after my accident, move to Mammoth um, in the Eastern Sierras in California because I could no longer surf on my own, but I could ski on my own. So I was like, okay, I need to go all in on skiing, which I did. I moved to Mammoth kind of semi-seasonally. I came back to San Diego a couple summers in about a, a 10 year in, in, up, up there in Mammoth and uh, skied my ass off. <laughs> and then, yeah, up there, there's this backcountry peak that's kind of a rite of passage for, um, for locals. And, uh, you know, every spring and summer, my friends would go out there and come back with these stories of this mountain named Bloody Couloir. And I was like, fuck, I need to be out there. You know, like I just felt so left behind and so frustrated that I was not with them because if I wasn't in a chair, I would be. I was like, okay, I need to figure this out. We need to figure this out. We need to get my ass out there. So, um, yeah, that's what led to the whole bloody cool water expedition, man. And the documentary film and <laughs> going on tour with the film and kind of launched my speaking career. Um, that's right. Yeah. I did, epic. I did notice. Yeah. Uh, being an inspirational speaker, driving, touring around, sharing your story, um, that's it's just amazing to me as I kind of went through everything to to see kind of what happens to get you know it's kind of interesting for me to think about why people are the way they are and how they get that way you know it, it, whether it's me or you or anybody else I find myself just you know wondering about people and their background and and what makes people the way they are and so you've got all of these experiences that you're able to take out and, and, and share with people. Um, and you, you've got such a great outgoing personality. Um, do you, do you find yourself, are you, are you still in the, uh, speaking circuit? You, you still go out and, and share your story or are you doing more of just the trail to trail design and that kind of stuff, the trail work? Well, Yes, I still do speaking. I'm still getting speaking gigs, but they're all virtual right now. And then, sure, and yeah, way less of them. Uh, yeah. Way less of them. Um, yeah. But yeah, that is one thing I do. But to answer your question, yes, I do, and do find myself doing more trail consulting than speaking now these days, um, just because of this huge wave right now of just. Um, just knowledge that having some having trails of being adapter friendly is really important. Um, so, so absolutely. What, what, what does that mean? Uh, being, you know, trails being adaptive friendly, uh, kind of explain that for a listener. I get it. I've been following you and understand it, but maybe for our listeners kind of explain what that means to you and what your kind of mission is in, in, in that work. Uh, that is also the question of the day <laughs> um, because adaptive friendly means so many different things. I mean, when you think of adaptive riders, um, just the spectrum of, of equipment is huge. There's all different kinds of bikes um, from you know, and the major differences are in like front wheel drive versus rear wheel drive and full suspension versus rigid and um, power assist versus no power assist. And those are kind of the three main factors in the bikes, like with or without those things, you know, are, is a big difference what they can do. Um, for example, like if you have front wheel drive on a bike, anything steep and loose, you're going to need to push up it. So when I'm documenting trails, I really have to think about that, you know, because um, my bike's rear wheel drive with full suspension and a power assist that can kind of go through anything. Um, and then also you have like the spectrum of 
of disabilities, which is huge. I mean, you're going all the way from, you know, possibly high level quadriplegic um, all the way to a below knee amputee or, you know, brain injury, you know, on, you know, you know, it, you know, uh, disability that's not obvious at all, you know, um, <laughs> to maybe even just like a knee injury or a hip injury or a replaced hip, you know, it's the spectrum is huge. And then you add the spectrum of actual writing ability, you know, you know, you know, people's skill sets, you know, what, what they're good at, how long they've been riding, whether they're beginner, intermediate expert, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, and so when it comes to officially adaptive friendly, um, there is a full spectrum and gamut to, to think about. Um, and so I've got a lot on my mind when I'm riding a trail, when I'm actually assessing. And uh, I found that it's in a relatively unique knowledge set. Um, so that's where the consulting comes into play. Um, being able to consider all those all the different equipment, all the different disabilities and abilities um, while while performing an assessment. Um, that that's where it's at. That's the tough part. And then um, so um, I've come up with uh, a rating system to to help with that. Um, and the rating system is is controversial. I love it <laughs> <laughs> because people want more information. This rating system is very simplified. Um, and, but the logic behind having, you know, collecting all this on for all this awesome information just doesn't work because what, what most, you know, we want to, it's the 80, 20 rule, right? Like serve the yeah. majority, serve yeah. the majority. Um, and so when I th you think of the majority, what are the, what are the majority of trail users doing? Are they doing like very detailed trail research before they go out? No. Um, what they're, what they're doing is, uh, looking for recommended routes. Where do I ride? You know, what, what trails do I ride? Give me a recommended route and also, um, watching video. Those are kind of the two main things. And sometimes you can get people to maybe skim a blog, you know, <laughs> they'll do that. They'll skim through a blog. They're not going to read it word for word. I can almost guarantee you that I've got a trail blog and the amount of people that have probably read it word for word, are very, very few, I bet, but it's there. The information is there. It's available for those who want to that, that other, you know, 20%. So we can spend all our time gathering all this amazing information and no one's going to use it. And those that do use it for everything in the middle. Okay. For example, okay. The, the rating system is, is a three tier rating system. Right. There's yep. AMTB one, two, and three. AMTB stands for adaptive mountain bike. Um, the, and it answers, all it does is answer the question. Do you need a support rider or not? AMTB one. No, you don't need a support rider. And AMTB three. Yes, you do need a support rider. AMTB two. That's maybe. <laughs> it depends. Now, most yeah. trails fall into AMTB too, you know, and that's where the gray area is. Okay, say you provide all this off awesome information about about camber and I mean I you know the uh, detailed stuff and um, for everything in the middle, there's still a question. There's still a maybe, and the only way to know for sure is to to write it. Um, it, it is that's the only way and so that's why um, we operate under the blanket rule of um, for adaptive riders do not ride new single track alone for the first time right you know uh, know where you are in that spectrum of uh, equipment rider disability rider ability and shift the scale accordingly if you need to because if you're on one end of the spectrum, you might need to shift the scale. And if you're on the other end of the spectrum, you might need to shift the scale a little bit. Know where you're at. If you're, if you're, you know, outside the mean, the average rider, it's all math, dude. It's all, I'm yeah. telling you, I'm super linear thinking. It's all math and logic. Um, 
so shift it if you need to. And then if you're, and there's two types of riders out there as well. You can break riders into two very specific categories, which are very different uh, riders with support and riders without. Uh, riders with support can ride a lot more than riders without I'm telling you that right now. So if you're riding alone um, in an area for the first time, stick to what's a MTB one. You're probably going to miss the best trails the area has to offer, but you're not going to gamble. I've learned the hard way not to gamble anymore, man. I've been out there and I've been absolutely fucked. Like I've been helicoptered out. Yeah, I've been, um, I saw on your content, you got caught in a flash flood. You've been- I got caught in a flash out. flood situation, semi flash flood. Oh God, that's a crazy story, man. Uh, I was, uh, I was, I didn't look at the weather before going out. I was having just a full ego day. I was, uh, I was like, I got to get out and prove to myself that I am strong. You know, one of those days, um, I was just, you know, having a rough day. So it was all I could do to get out on this ride. I did not look at the weather. Um, pretty much right when I started riding, it started raining and then it turned into a total downpour. And where I ride here, it's all like this thick clay. So it was just sticky. Um, and I ride through this creek. Um, you know, it was about the water was maybe a foot deep, not bad. And um, I took it slow because I, I couldn't see I couldn't see how deep it was and I wasn't sure. And that's where I messed up is I took it slow. So I got stuck. And then with trying to get started again, I broke my chain. Oh, man. So here I am in this creek in a pouring Gosh. rain with a broken chain. I'm a paraplegic. Don't forget about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, so, small, that's a small part. Yeah, you don't. Want to yeah, that. so there's no walking the bike, bro. That's not a luxury I have. You know, I'm not walking it back to the trailhead. So I gotta fix it, and so I carry tons of tools. I carry everything I need. You know, mostly everything I need for most contingencies. I'm prepared to fix my chain, as most people are. Um, so, anyways, I get out of the bike. I get on the ground which is actually, actually a luxury that I have that a lot of adaptive riders don't. A lot of adaptive riders can't even do that. And that's another rule. If you can't fix your bike, don't ride alone. You know, cause yeah. you don't have, you can't walk your bike. That's kind of, that's kind of my two cents with, for adaptive riders. But anyway, so I'm sitting in, you know, about a foot of water working on my chain and, uh, some water, water breaks loose. I, I, I hear this like water run rushing all of a sudden. And I look up and I see the embankment just like falling down and water just starts rushing into the creek. And instantly I'm in chest deep water. My bike is completely submerged. I'm oh, alone, man. man. I'm alone. And the bank is about, is, is about head high. <laughs> now, I've got to get my bike up onto the bank from a seated position. So I'm ducking underwater and like lifting it and pushing it. And uh, you can imagine, use your imagination what that's like yeah. <laughs> from a seated position without ab muscles or back muscles, you know, lifting a, a 57 pound bike from underwater <laughs> onto an overhead bank insane bro like insane the um the level of effort and grit yeah. i i, I, I can never imagine. i can never explain to you in words what level i had to go to in that moment yeah to, to get that done to survive um and then pull myself out and then Luckily, my phone was before iPhones were waterproof. Um, luckily, my phone was in a life proof case. I should totally write life proof um, <laughs> and tell them this story. Um, luckily, my phone was fine, <laughs> you know, oh, wow. and I was able to call for help. Um, and uh, I was able to get myself to an out in the canyon where uh, the, the people I called for help could could pick me up 
which was a whole other thing too, because my, you know, after I fixed my chain, my uh, drive train just kept, just kept, just getting, kept getting clogged up with clay. So I had to stop like every five, 10 feet and, oh, and clear shit. it as best as I could. At that time, wow. I had an external drive train, which I've learned is not good for adaptive riders. That's another thing in the equipment yeah. capability list. If you have an external drive train, you're going to get, you're going to get stuck a lot more. Um, it's all about the internal roll off hub where none of that you don't have to worry about any of that yeah right that was crazy so yeah so i've gotten into situations out there and imagine just not even an insane situation like that just turning around on single narrow single track with exposure you know just imagine doing that yeah <laughs> you know oh shit this trail is is not going to be good i've got to turn around imagine getting out of the bike turning just like austin powers <laughs> yeah slowly getting that bike around and then getting back into it yeah. <laughs> and like narrow single track exposed like that's a shitty situation man and not totally gnarly but not something I want to experience anymore, man. And I've just learned to just not gamble with myself, with my body, with my equipment um, anymore. Uh, it's just, it's just not good. So that's what the rating system supports is just uh, a safe, um, smart experience um, and directs people to the, to the best mountain biking experience. And it doesn't exist on its own either. Um, it exists with trail blogs that I mentioned all and all the other uh, information that exists already. Uh, you know, we work with trail forks, right? Yeah. So, you know, the topo profile, all the information, all the awesome information there already and, and on all other trail resources, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. And then also uncut video, right? That's how the whole YouTube channel started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got. I went through yeah. uh, a lot of your videos, and and for our listeners, as we're talking with Jeremy McGee about adaptive cycling or adaptive biking, um, just got through a story about kind of how he got to where he's at now. And I should mention, Jeremy, we're, we're talking about all this, but we we didn't really bring out the kind of the the, the umbrella for this is unpavement.org, right? Yep. 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 And you've got a, a, a website, jeremymcgee.com, and the videos and the blog and all this information we're talking about, our listeners can go to those two places and get all of that information. Absolutely. Yeah, that's kind of where it all is. Um, jeremymcgee.com, there's an H in McGee, yeah. M-C-G-H-E-E. -E. Um, but I, I think if you type you without the H into the Google thing, it still comes up. And then, uh, yeah, the unpavement.org. Um, and that's how the unpavement started, man. Um, you know, you're like, what is the unpavement? What the hell does that mean? Um, well, it's a, it's a movement of all of us, not just uh, people with disabilities, but all of us off the pavement and into nature because uh, we spend, we have these awesome devices, you know, these enable us to, to accomplish so much today. These are great. This is how I'm able to put out the content that I'm putting out. Um, but with that, we're spending so much time on these things it renders us that much more in need for a relationship with nature. It's not just important. It's vital. It's to, to have a, a state, a, a, a mental, a healthy mental state, you got to be active outdoors. You got to be, um, yeah. you got to have a relationship with nature. Um, and this is proven stuff. This isn't just something I'm, I'm just like making up. This is actually scientifically proven. Um, so that, that's why, you know, moving off the pavement, we, we, we live in this artificial world, you know, getting out to what I call the real world, you know, the world that's exist, existed for millions of years, you know, get out there. Um, so that's why the um, pavement and, uh, and to be able to do it safely. So the um, pavement's information, it's information for adaptive riders to, to have that relationship with nature safely, 
that's that, that's the whole premise that's cool yeah and you mentioned that you know being connected with nature the, the, the health benefits and things like that it's really kind of funny with all that's been going on with COVID, working from home, being socially distanced, and just pretty much at my house twenty four seven. There were it was I guess it was back in the fall. I went for about two weeks. I didn't I didn't get to ride very much. I don't know if it was weather, if it was work, or whatever. But I didn't ride my bike for a couple of weeks. And then one day I went out. My wife was gone. Uh, I went out for a ride. She got home and we were talking, and she's like you got to ride your bike today, didn't you? And I said, well, yeah, how'd you know? And she said, well, I can just tell. <laughs> You're in a better mood. You're in a better mood than you were <laughs> before. Yes. Yes. And dude, I, I swear to God, I, I am not one of these motivated people. I'm not. I, I wake up um, tired and in pain, you know? Uh, you, you said earlier that, you know, I, I've lived... Uh, no holds barred kind of life. And that's true. I've lived with reckless abandon, um, zero direction in my life. And my body feels it today. <laughs> you know, I'm 44 years old. And uh, <coughs> yeah, man, I, I don't wake up feeling good. I don't wake up all, you know, life is very cyclical and fluctuating, both things. Um, we're kind of riding this amoeba around, yeah, right? right. Yeah, exactly. And um, <laughs> some days are some days are great. Some days are terrible. Waking up feeling terrible, and everything in between, you know. So I go through, and I go through this. I have a propensity for um, choosing comfort and for uh, procrastination, and it's this hump that I have to get over every time I do anything, especially getting ready to go for a ride. Um, that's why accountability is so important for me. But yeah, to, and I just remember, I remind myself of that feeling that you just explained that your wife noticed in you, in you man. I remind myself of that when I'm like, oh, I'm tired. I don't know. You know, da, da, it's going to be so much work. Da, 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 da. Um, I'm not, I don't feel excited. I just remind myself, you know how this works. You go out there, you come back and you're stoked. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. 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 And I go through the motions. I get out there and I show up and I, I mean, it's rare. I mean, there's been cases where I'm like, eh, I could have not gone, you know, but that's so rare. That's so rare. It's always, I definitely feel better than beforehand. Absolutely. Yeah. There's it's been a big few, deal, man. Very few occasions where I've been out. I, I find myself more of an adventure rider. I don't race. I have raced in the past, not professionally or anything, but just, you know, kind of local stuff. But I find myself being more of an adventure rider or uh, on the gravel bike now. And But there's very, very few occasions where I, I regret having gone to ride. You know, it's always there's always an upside exercise at the very least you're getting exercise yeah. you know at the very least and that you're like all right cool I, you know i got my heart rate up my i got exercise i can eat some protein now yeah <laughs> you know right, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. drink and some more beer muscle. you drink more yeah. Beer. yeah uh kind of that kind of goes in hand in hand for me yeah. man i i like to have a beer after riding yeah it's, it's just part of it it's just yeah. part of it dude gravel is a huge thing right now oh my god that is a major wave right now the gravel riders are out in force yeah that's I, huge i enjoy it i kind of found myself i kind of i just kind of ended up there um my son and i in 2018 we were riding in a charity road riding event in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we got smoked by a semi. We got clipped oh. on our on our left side. Actually and hit? Yeah, actually, actually like hit. Clipped. We didn't we didn't we didn't get pulled under the, the truck by any means or I wouldn't be here right now. But but we kind of got oh, crazed right. on the side. And um, ever since that incident I've kind of just gravitated to more gravel gravel riding, mountain bike riding. I don't find myself on the road nearly as much as, as I used to. Um, so you're a yeah. converted roadie. Yeah. 
converted you're converted you have seen the light my friend yeah you're right yeah <laughs> well yeah i mean being on the road's awesome and it, I, I, I mean if but when you add traffic in other cars and semi trucks especially yeah it it doesn't but, feel like you're in nature well you know? i was going to say that you, you yeah. lose the nature component the nature element of that it's there i mean you've got you know the you know whatever's next to the road going by you you know, yeah. grasses and things like that and views, amazing views. Um, you, you've got that. And that is a really awesome part of road riding. Yeah. I actually, if, if I didn't live in Southern California, I think I would have a, a road bike just for, you know, inclement weather days and things like that when you when trail riding or whatever is not an option. Um, if I live in the mountains or something. Yeah. So it does have the nature element to it, I, I think, but you, but not like being actually on the trail, of course. Right, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, mentioning nature, you were recently, so I guess to kind of bring this in for Natural State Bikes, uh, the podcast is about all things bike-related in Arkansas. You were recently in Arkansas doing some work on adaptive trail design and consulting and research and spent some time here. Uh, I think you wrote at Kohler, the rail yard, Blowing Springs. Uh, so kind of share for our listeners, what was that experience like in, in coming to Bentonville? I know you'd been here in the past uh, in speaking at the Imba Summit, um, but now actually getting out to ride, meet some folks, get some guided rides in and that kind of thing. So kind of share a little bit about that. Absolutely. Well, um... To be correct, I wasn't there trail consulting. Okay, I cool. was uh, the uh, the visitors bureau had me come out to make videos. This is my first. Oh, okay, uh, I wasn't paid, but you know they they helped me out with some expenses. Sure, yeah, you know, but my first like content creation gig, which oh, is wow. a big deal for me, which is a huge, nice which is a huge transition to be, to be recognized as a creator and an influencer, which I'm a peon. I realize, I realize it, but I'm growing slowly, but surely things are growing. Um, and everything's completely organic, uh, in, in my reach. Um, I don't pay for followers. Yeah. Secret. <laughs> most people secret. Most people are paying for followers. Right. Yeah. My, yeah. so, but I don't, I definitely don't. Um, and yeah, so you're that's one man, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, you're, you're a one man gig. One man gig. And most people are, most people are one man gigs. Uh, you know, the huge influence are not, they have a, they have a crew, they have editors yeah. and everything, which yeah. I hope to have an editor someday soon. That's, that's going to open up a lot of time for more, for more content creation. But anyways, so I was out there making videos and which is really exciting for me. Um, but yeah, naturally when I'm riding, I naturally you know, am assessing trails, you know, I'll run into something. I'm like, okay, well this one little change can, can get this whole user group through right here on this trail. Um, but yeah, great experience, man. I just felt like I dove into this like community of support there. Um, man, just good, good people. Um, everybody, uh, just wanted to help. I actually, um, was having a major mechanical, um, I, <laughs> the hotel I stay at in Mammoth, um, and I spend a lot of time there. Uh, my bike stays outside. I can't get my bike in the door. Um, and so it stays, it's locked. It's on the back of my car, but someone was messing with it overnight one night. Um, they tried to steal, um, my, sh my shocks <laughs> and, uh, it's crazy. but I didn't know it. I didn't notice it. And so I had actually had a shock bolt missing and, um, they must've not known what they were doing. They didn't know to like take all the air out <laughs> first and <laughs> yeah. like they just aborted mission. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it could have rattled out, but that's a long bolt. There's, yeah. The chances of that happening, of that bolt rattling out, is, I've never had that happen ever in my career yeah. of adaptive mountain biking, ever. Um, there is that chance. Yes, that could have happened, 
but I don't think so. I think someone tried to tried to steal my shocks. That makes all, the chances of that are a lot greater. Anyway, so I was riding without a shock ball and riding hard. Um, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with terrain at Mammoth, but it's raw. And I mean, it's like rock drops and rock gardens and technical. Um, and I was jumping, I was riding Sky Park, which is a, a bike park at Lake Arrowhead and San Bernardino Mountains here by Big Bear. Um, jumping and riding hard. And then I was on this uh, trail uh, consulting and building gig in Portland. And the guys uh, that, that contracted us looking at my bike, we're checking out my bike, you know, one day, you know, that's what men do. We look at stuff gear, you know, <laughs> and uh, guy knows says, you're missing a shock bolt. Holy crap. Um, well, it turns out, and then I just, you know, we put a shock bolt in and I kept riding. Well, it turns out um, in <laughs> looking at the bike with the boys over beers in Bentonville that um, they noticed that my shocks were blown out. Well, that one of them was blown out. And then once I got it to the shop, we real and got the shocks out, we realized that the other one was completely blown out too. I mean, we had um, oil in come out of the um, wrong chamber. Like it was, is bad. Like oil came out of the Schrader valve in my shock. So it, they're, they're done. They're totally done. There's no bringing those back. Um, so I had to, um, order order shocks um which i ordered through jensen usa i want to give a shout out to them um i ordered two uh brand new shocks um and they had them and they're in california they had them across the country i ordered them on a saturday afternoon i had a monday wow yeah and it was only like 45 bucks for the overnight which is you know in the grand scheme of things not much at all, especially as high as shipping prices are right now. 45 bucks to overnight two shocks over the weekend, over Sunday. And I had them Monday, um, a day ahead of schedule, actually, which was which was awesome. A testament to, I think they came UPS, testament UPS, awesome. So, but Jensen USA, if you need, they're, they're fast and they're great and they have almost everything. So anyways, I got these shocks and it seemed like everybody wanted to help. Everybody there wanted to like <laughs> leave their job and come help me install these shocks. It was awesome. I had like a like so many people helping me. <laughs> it it was it was great. It's such a community of, of support. Um, and yeah, I did uh, camp at Kohler, which is so nice, dude. So nice. I was so comfortable. Um, the bathrooms and the showers there are gorgeous um the campsites are really cool and the trails oh my god yeah i'm sure you've ridden Kohler. so yeah. fun oh my god so fun and um that's what i found you know i'm not really i'm kind of like you i'm more like i'm more of an adventure rider too you know i uh and you wouldn't know that by looking at some of my stuff recently especially from there because the the stuff is built so well there. I'm so comfortable jumping um, on a lot of the stuff there because uh, they're, the jumps are built so well. It's like, it's like almost no effort. It's not scary at all. Um, and to say that as an adaptive rider, like because jumping as an yeah. adaptive rider normally is very, very scary. Yeah. Um, and uh, like, God, there's, a, I overshot one of the jumps at the rail yard and yeah, I, I saw that video landing in the flat, almost vertical. Oh my yeah. God. That's yeah. a testament. And that was with blown out shocks too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so for that thing to take that with blown out shocks, it shows you how well they're built. Um, but yeah, man, it was a great experience, mostly because of the people and uh, I'm, I've lived in, California my entire life born and raised in San Diego I've lived in my place here for over 10 years almost going on 11 I have a good thing going here I live right on the water I could open my door and show you the ocean from here right now wow we could probably see whale spouts wow I have everything I need I have a community of support here too you know good friends I love surfing I'm on the ocean so for me to give this up and move away 
you move to Bentonville shows you how awesome that place is, you know, and uh, it's all about the people for me. Yeah, uh, that's it. I'm yeah, scared. there's a great I'm totally it, scared. It, it's a great community here. Um, I would say, though, don't give up that view of the ocean lightheartedly because we've got about 10 inches of snow on the ground right now. And just a couple of days ago, it was 20 below with the wind chill. Now, well, I'm going to live seasonally. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yeah. That's... Yeah, man. I got, I, um, uh, I'm no, I'm nomadic in my heart. Um, yeah. and that's why the, the van, um, yeah. I want home base. I want to home. I want to buy a home. It's not going to happen here. I don't have a million dollars, but it can happen there in Arkansas. And uh, so, yeah, when I, for my golden years, if yeah. you know, hopefully I make it to those years for the first time in my life, I'm thinking about that. Yeah. I've never, I didn't think I'd live to see 40, to be honest with you. Um, and so now I'm thinking about a future and working towards the future and actually making money for the first time in my life, which is great. Um, so I want my home base there and uh, I want to live there when it's, uh, when it's nice yeah right <laughs> in the spring yeah. and fall in the spring and fall i'm going to be in arkansas and i'm i'm also the u.s distributor for the for the bikes i ride they're made in poland okay and cool. i'm um uh i've ordered my demo bikes I've, i'm acquiring demo bikes and i want to be in a destination mountain bike place um so that's another reason for bentonville so nice. i'm gonna have my demo i'm gonna have my demos and uh, my goal is to be booked out uh spring and fall with uh with uh, performing demos for people um, whether they're buying bikes or not and yeah, then uh mentioning your bike you've got a it's a hand cranked mountain bike right because you yep, don't have yep, use of your a, legs it's hand cranked so correct it's a uh specifically a, a full suspension off-road hand cycle um or adaptive mountain bike you yeah. know but more specifically there's tons of different types of adapt, adaptive mountain bikes more specifically full suspension off-road hand cycle yes yeah um and we have different models too like mine's kind of more of a forward position um uh but we also have another tadpole design tadpole means two wheels in front mm -hmm. and the drive wheel in the rear uh, we also have one that's an upright seated position um, gotcha. it, you know and it's just a matter of preference um you know it's just a little more comfortable being seated you know um but yeah, and it all, we also, and that bike can be outfitted with a, an elbow shifter, an elbow brake. You know, most quadriplegics have um, use, some use of their arms. And then, and then, in the, but maybe their grip isn't mm -hmm. very good. So we've got handles that kind of strap their carbon, custom carbon handles, where they have their hands kind of strapped to the, the crank. And then they have an elbow shifter and elbow brake the full suspension the thing can climb anything and still jump off rocks and quadriplegic can get out there and go shred it it's pretty freaking amazing yeah um but with the van uh, um i'll be able to live seasonally and i'll probably end up surfing more um because right now i totally take it for granted you know i'm hunkered when i'm here i'm like hunkered down on my computer editing video and it's all i can do to get i have a beach cruiser bike that I ride almost every day. That's how, that's my main source of exercise. Um, so I get out on that every day and kind of ride along, you know, the, the ocean and the, the, uh, along the cliff during, during sunset and listen to my Joe Rogan or whatever. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of, but it's kind of the bike where you kind of, you kind of need um, a sombrero and a drink holder. I always say right. yeah. <laughs> it's like that style of bike. But it's an arduous workout, man. I mean, any little incline. I'm like, oh my God, I'm cranking super. I just I have a super steep driveway too. But anyways, my plan is to live seasonally. So I'm not going to be there in the snow. I'll be here, Mammoth, Arizona um, during the winters and uh, during the summers, you know, here in Mammoth, um, let, kind of living out of the van. And I think I'll surf more because yeah. uh, when I'm here, I'll be surfing. Right. Um, yeah. Whereas now I've, I mean, I think I'm going to go today, actually, believe it or not. Um, oh, man. Rub it in, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's still not warm here. You think San Diego, you think it's warm. Look, man, I'm wearing a beanie and everything. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's, it's, it's chilly, you know, it's chilly. It's, and you add that, you know, that humidity to the air and the, the breeze coming off the ocean and 
Um, I had a friend from Alaska uh, just staying here and she was freezing. <laughs> she was like, oh, it's wow. so cold, turn the heater on. It's cold, it's, it's cold. like 50 degrees here. You, you're, you're wearing a hoodie and maybe a yeah. beanie or whatever. 50 degrees in the mountains where it's dry, t-shirt. You know, yeah. you add that humidity. Yeah, to that air. dampness, it makes, yeah. It makes it cold, man. It makes, yeah. it, it, makes it chilly, yeah. Now mentioning... The, uh, the, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, you go ahead. I was going to say, mentioning uh, being in Arkansas seasonally, you're, you are scheduled uh, to be at the Bentonville Bike Fest in June, so we'll at least yeah. see you back here in June sometime, right? <laughs> I'll be back in June, uh, probably in May. Um, so my van is being built by Van Do It in Kansas City. Um, they're awesome, by the way. Um, I want definitely want to give them a shout out. They have a really cool business model um, where they take uh, off lease Ford Transits from Ford. They have a relationship. Oh with Ford. yeah, 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 yeah. So cool. they take you know. Uh, uh, transits passenger vans not cargo vans that's different than most outfitters yeah. and um after when they come back from a lease um they acquire them they also acquire they also build on new as well which my van uh, i'm built i'm building on a brand new 2021 all-wheel drive um but then they have this uh like modular minimalistic system so it gets kind of applied. They put this T-Track skeleton in and then you can plug and play all the different parts gotcha. and choose what you want and switch it out and everything. So it kind of like applies it to kind of an assembly line kind of thing. And it, their vans come in at, at like 70 grand, well under a hundred grand, as opposed to, you know, most vans out there are like, you know, 175 to like 300 grand for, for holy cow, for, yeah, for a bill like 250, you know, kind of 185 to 250. I've seen is kind of the range for vans, these are under 100 grand. Nice, and they take trade ins and finance the whole procurement, which is amazing. Dude. Yeah, it's amazing. this, this, this company is really good, so I highly recommend checking them out. If anybody does go there, tell them I sent you, um. Not only will you get the treatment, but I get a kickback. Yeah, there you go. So make sure you tell them, Jeremy, I heard about it from Jeremy McGee. Um, and they give me a kickback because I'm not a rich man out here. And um, this van is very expensive. And uh, the more um, referrals that trans transfer to actual sales, they, they help me out. And that's, they're in Kansas City? They're in Kansas City, uh, Lee's Summit just yep, outside just yep, part of Kansas yep. city yep yep so they're guess, awesome they'll they'll finish the van there then it'll be shipped to you and then you'll come back to the midwest yeah they can ship it but dude they they're so cool they're a family they want to meet you you're like oh nice hey, freaking get a one-way flight and go pick up your van or drive your car trade it in and leave with the van it's actually the i you know i was exploring all options i'm kind of guy that needs to have everything on the table before i make a decision like this i was exploring everything i actually put a deposit on a van here with a local ford dealership who uh, my friend is a salesman there i know the owner i'm friends with his daughter it was, they're gonna give me the bro deal on on a ford transit and everything i had that going i had a you know um a deal going with a local mobility company that was gonna do a full thing for me um, I was exploring all options and the, the factor that um, pushed me over the fence to make me dive into it. And I just made this decision yesterday, by the way, <laughs> I put my down payment yesterday. Where was it the day before? Yesterday. yesterday. Um, so this is all brand new was, you know, I can't just drive onto a lot and leave with a new car. Right. There's yeah. a lot of logistics for me to consider like strategizing the whole, um, yeah mobility outfit outfit with the lift because i have to get a wheelchair lift put in and hand controls and all that um and i have to have swiveling seats i can't even if i have a lift i still can't transfer yeah. to the driver's seat unless yeah. it turns for me to get in i i can't do that transfer you know maybe when i was in my 20s i could have done that climb around like a monkey but i can't do that anymore um so it's this whole thing and what pushed me over the edge is 
since this company, since Van Do It is kind of doing the full procurement of everything, the chassis, the, the, the wheelchair lift and everything, and also the full build out, I'm literally going to be driving my Subaru into the lot oh, and man. driving off with the van. No logistics. Yeah. That's, that's a big deal for, yeah. for someone with a disability or a wheelchair user to be able to do that. And that's a big sell for me. So wheelchair users out there, this, that's, this is how you do it. This is where you don't have to figure everything out. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'll be there in June. I will have the van, which um, they bumped up my delivery date for me um because i'm special <laughs> and uh i sh i most likely there's a chance i might not um but it's most likely i will have the van for the event um and this event is incredible like to be listed amongst the pros that are there um it is an amazing honor i never thought i'd be at this place in my life man um uh and i've got booth space they've given me booth space i'm gonna have demo bikes um i'm going to be putting on leading um at least one group ride um, and they'll be all about explaining you know um, adaptive bikes and uh, trail rating and learning about that kind of stuff it'll be really cool and i'll also be presenting a keynote oh nice um, yeah yeah which would be really fun really i'm really excited and I'll probably be camping with my van at Kohler during yeah. the, but the van is going to be parked front and center. Uh, I, you know, I, I've got that blue placard, yeah. so I'm going to, I'm, I don't use it all the time. I, I use it because I need a little extra space on the side to get right. out. I don't need the proximity. I need the space. Yeah. So if I can find a space with space, I'll, if it's far away, I'll take that instead. Um, unless I'm like, buying groceries or something big and it's hard to carry back to the car but anyways um i'm going to use that blue placard and i'm going to park front and center at the event the van is going to be there my bike is going to be in the back um i will most likely have beer from sierra nevada who's a sponsor um and promoting the van promoting the bikes promoting the trails project and stoking people out awesome pretty excited man pretty excited and that'll be here soon really cool. it's it, it, dude a few weeks away man pretty much a few weeks away yeah yeah and man people yeah. are, people are jones as you know people are you, since things have just been shut down people are jonesing for events and activities and just to get some kind of sense of normalcy back so uh, yeah and it's gonna be a huge huge time huge i think time. as long as we're we're smart about it and yep. everybody is vigilant i think uh I think it'll be safe. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I, I'm, I should be vaccinated by then. I'm pretty excited. So I know there's still worries, even when you're vaccinated, you still carry, so you still gotta wear a mask. You know, you, we still yeah. don't know. We still don't have the research in place yet, um, but less worries, you know, right. yeah. um, you know, a yeah. little less stress. I can um, maybe definitely not relax fully, um, but relax a little bit. Yeah. I'll yeah. still be wearing a mask and keeping my distance and sure. that's, not letting anybody spit in my mouth yeah you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> hey man we've been going on about a little over an hour and 15 or 20 minutes um you mentioned you are on vacation i want to respect your time dude we could talk for a lot longer just going off on tangents and stuff but i want to respect your time and and get you off here you said you were going to go probably surf today. So I want to get you to that. But I do want to thank you for taking time uh, to jump on the podcast and share your story. Um, a lot of great stuff there. And for our listeners, as we wrap up with Jeremy McGee, Jeremy, if you would shoot, uh, give us those uh, the websites again for Jeremy McGee and Unpavement. So we our listeners can go there and get some more info. Uh, thanks for that. I, I appreciate that platform. It means a lot. I work hard and um, having, having people follow stuff is, is uh, extremely validating. And like I said, I don't always wake up raring to go. So when I get the comments and things like that, that's what keeps me going. 
So yeah, if you go, if if you guys are listening, go to jeremymcgee.com, the pavement.org. Um, if you have a friend in a chair who wants to ride, JPM Pro Sales is the sales website to get bikes. There's uh, a, a funding page on there uh, where people can look on how to get um, help with funding to get the bikes because they're not cheap and they're very expensive to build and ship and everything. Um, the number one thing right now is subscribe to the YouTube channel, man. Um, Jeremy P. McGee on, on YouTube. Um, the on pavement with Jeremy P. McGee. Um, that's, that's kind of the main, main spot right now. Um, so yeah, check out the websites, uh, subscribe, uh, to the, to the blogs and, uh, the, and the YouTube channel and drop me a line, man, drop me a comment. Tell me you like my stuff because it really helps me. It really does. Very cool. Yeah. And great content. I've been through a, a fair amount of it. Still have a lot to go because you've got a lot of content out there, but <laughs> pumping it of, out, man. I listened to Gary V. Gary yeah. V helped me with that. <laughs> yeah. Just, cool. just uh, his whole thing is self-awareness and self-awareness, empathy, and execution, man. Um, put your, know what you're good at and know your place, feel what others feel and put your head down and grind it out for 10 years. That's what he says, basically. Yeah. That's what I'm doing, man. I'm putting my head down and I am hustling <laughs> and it feels good, man. It's not, it feels so good to have direction and purpose for the first time in my life, man. That's um, awesome. Yeah. I'm excited. And you kind of, Mentioning all that, I want to wrap up with one thing I read out of some of your content is a quote that was attributed to you. I don't remember, you know, again, for our listeners, um, you've been, your story's well told through uh, Bicycling Magazine, Ad Adventure Sports Journal, Outside. And in one of those that I was reading through, I read this quote and it said, um, it goes like this, if you feel like you don't have enough time to make your dreams and the things you love happen. Well, you get less of that every day. So do it now. And I thought that was really cool. Was yeah, really man. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I almost died that day and I've actually almost died a couple of times since then, you know, being paraplegic, there's a ton of other problems you don't see. It's a domino effect of issues and I've had surgeries that I almost didn't wake up from and things like that. Um, life is, life is fucking short. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm 44 and those 44 years have gone by in a flash. Yeah. Um, and from what I hear from my friends who are older than me, that it only gets faster. It and, does, dude. Um, Let me tell you, that's for sure. Yeah. And I have no reason to not believe that um, very soon the next, you know, the next 44 years are going to go by just as fast and not faster. And there's going to be, an 88 year old man <laughs> yeah. looking back at me in the mirror going, what the hell did you do with your life, man? Yeah. What did you do with your life? Yeah. So for me, answering the question, what do you want? And what kind of person do you want to be is really important answering that now, Yeah. you know, and specifically, this is what I want. I, I want a van and I want to live seasonally and I want to make videos and you know I want a house and I want to swim with the dolphins and I want to climb bloody couloir, you know, and uh, I want to ride the Whistler bike park, you know. Um, I want to move to Bentonville because if I don't, I'm gonna re always wonder what the hell would it have been like, you know? Do these things, like answer these questions. Like, what do you want? Yeah. And like I said, like answering the question, who do you want to be? What kind of person you want to be is also part of that because just enjoying our lives is the point here, but also growing as a person is also part of life, you know? So how do you want to grow, you know, and, and figuring out and then answering the question, okay, well, how do we get there? Yeah. How do we make this happen? You know? And um, it's all about doing those small things every day single day to make those things happen it's not going to happen all at once um and once we get there there's more that's what we do as humans we progress continually 
constantly always growing, always looking for more. That's part of it, you know? So reaching those goals and then setting more goals. Um, and the small, I say the small things every day because a win is a series of good decisions. Right. Yeah. And then, so every day looking at every little decision, does this serve my goals? Does this, does, does this lead towards a win? Cause I'll tell you what, Bobby, I'm sick of fucking losing dude. Yeah. Um, when you live with no direction, you lose a lot. I've lost a lot, man, just living with reckless abandon and no direction whatsoever. And when we actually have focus and goals and direction and we work towards it every single day, I mean, I'm talking the smallest decision, should I eat pizza or yeah. salad right now? You know, do I give my body building blocks or do I get mouth pleasure? You know, yeah. it's sometimes mouth pleasure is a place, dude, I drink beer and eat pizza. There's a place yeah. for that. It's important. It's important, you know, it, you know, th that we treat ourselves. Um, but when it comes to the grind day in and day out, making those, the, the decision that leads us towards our goals continuously. And when we look back and we've made those, those decisions and it builds up, that's what leads to a win. Um, and I'm, I'm ready to start winning, man. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> Well, that's that's great stuff, man. I look forward to uh, hooking up with you when you get out here in Bentonville and meeting you and uh, uh, getting more of your story. And uh, it's just been a great time visiting with you this morning. And I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to do that, Jeremy. Hell yeah. I've got goals for you now, Bobby. All right. We are going to, you're going to start a YouTube channel. Yep. And you're going to be presenting your podcast in video form. Cause you're going to reach a whole other audience that way. Yep. Uh, Spotify also, you do, you can post your, uh, your podcast and video form on Spotify as well. Awesome. Good to know. Um, which yeah. I just learned from watching Rogan. I, yeah. I you know, so he's on Spotify in vid on vid in video and, um, Leia, let's do a follow-up podcast yeah. when I'm there in person video. Yeah. Um, so record the video and sound, um, and let's do a follow-up. Yeah, let's do it, man. Um, when I'm good. there in person, man, and let's uh, let's have part of it be riding together, and I'll do yeah. a video for me. Yeah, do that as well. and uh, do a, get a ride in, and then wrap it up with some local craft beer, and uh, just have a good time. You're speaking my language, brother. All right, man. We'll be in touch, <laughs> Jeremy. Thanks. Thank you so much.